Well, thank you everyone for inviting me to, to your meeting. I'm really happy that um, to have the opportunity to share with you today and that you all would join, even though we couldn't join in person, that you would take the time to join on the video call. So thanks a lot. Um, my name is Kathy Maitland. I'm the director of the Michigan Abolitionist Project and we are an anti-human trafficking organization working primarily in Michigan. Um, I previously was uh, had a 14 year career at Hewlett Packard as a quality manager and I've been working in um, anti-trafficking work for about eight years now. So um, again, thank you for having me and I'm going to give you a little overview today of uh, what human trafficking is and what it looks like. And um, hopefully we'll have some time then for question and answer after the presentation. So if it's okay with everyone, I will get started by sharing my screen. And so our um, mission is to grow the movement of people and organizations working to prevent human trafficking in Michigan and beyond. We don't um, usually directly service human trafficking victims. Um, our focus is more on um, educating people and working with organizations to help um, strengthen our response um, and improve our response to human trafficking in Michigan. So one of the things that our organization does is we um, do a lot of education and meetings like this. Uh, typically they've been in-person meetings, but um, now we've been doing more Zoom meetings and online opportunities, but there's a lot to learn about the complexities of human trafficking. And so we do a lot of education and training. And our hope is that we would engage and inspire people to take some kind of action um, to help them address the root causes of slavery and to hopefully one day eradicate it. We believe that human trafficking can be eradicated if we can um, address the demand that drives exploitation. And just as a trafficker creates and uses sophisticated networks um, to exploit people, um, our hope is that MAP will work to create a similar network that's um, more coordinated and, and more um, a sophisticated response to eradicating demand. So we are active in building partnerships and fostering environments where people and organizations can get together to address the very many complexities of human trafficking. And basically we say, um, although there's a long le legal definition of human trafficking, simply put, human trafficking is modern day slavery. It's where people profit from the control and exploitation of other people. And the legal um, definition includes that they would do so by using either force or fraud or coercion. Typically there's some type of action um, and then there's a means and the means uh, is the presence of force, fraud or coercion. And this means that the person has not given their consent or isn't acting of their own free will. So they may induce somebody, trick somebody. Um, often there's uh, traffickers that are recruiting, um, especially young people through social media um, harboring, transporting, providing, um, say, uh, a home or food to somebody who might be homeless. And they, those actions, then they use a means, either force or fraud or coercion, to either commit a commercial sex act or to um, labor traffic or other type of services. Now, one thing that's important to note is that when it comes to the commercial sex exploitation of minors, of children, there does not have to be a means um, proven. Any child who is exploited for commercial sex is automatically considered a victim of human trafficking. Um, if it's an adult over 18, then there needs to be some type of means that is proven, either force, fraud, or coercion. Force would be something like physical assaulting, um, kidnapping, Fraud is false promises, um, promises of wages or working conditions that turn out to be fraudulent. And coercion is like threats of harm or, or debt bondage or psychological manipulation. 
Um, coercion could also be um, using drugs, using drugs as a means to keep a person um, doing what you want them to do. And the thing about human trafficking is all over government, although governments all around the world um, pretty much agree that slavery is wrong and should not happen, um, we are finding that there's human trafficking existing and happening everywhere around the world. And it's all of its victims share one common essential experience, and that's the loss of their freedom. Human trafficking is said to be one of the greatest human rights causes of our time. Some of the numbers, um, we'll talk a little bit about why statistics are a little bit difficult to find and um, with human trafficking, but some of the numbers that we know, um, our US State Department reports that there's 24.9 million people um, enslaved in the world today. And that, that is like one victim out of every 185 people. It's an underground criminal activity um, raising $150 billion. Some say that it's um, the second largest, uh, the third largest, it's one of the largest uh, criminal activities in our world today, right after the drug trade. And of more than, um, it's been found in all 50 states in the United States, <laughs> and of more, more than 23,000 um, endangered runaways have been reported to the National Missing and Exploited Children Organization. One in six of those runaways are likely victims of sex trafficking. So one of the problems with statistics, um, you know, often people want to know, well, how much trafficking is going on in my community or is it in my neighborhood? And, and um, we'd like to, to know more statistics about the problem because it helps us understand the problem. But the one thing about human trafficking that's so different than other criminal activities is that it's widely underreported. Um, and that's why we lack reliable statistics. Um, and just to give you an example of um, what I mean by widely underreported, um, you know, if I, um, if I had, uh, go out to, the, to my car and find that it's been um, stolen or vandalized, um, I'm not ashamed to be, call myself a victim of a crime. I'll call the police. Um, the police will come and they will, um, you know, take down my information. They'll, they'll help me solve the, the problem that I have. My neighbors might feel sorry for me, lend me a car. But that's not the way it is with victims of human trafficking. They often don't know that they're a victim. They often don't see a way out of their situation and they don't call the police. They don't ask for help. They find their situation to be hopeless and often do not report to law enforcement or to anyone for that matters. So it's widely underreported. But even though it is widely underreported, we know from many experts that trafficking is a problem in all of our communities across Michigan and it's growing at an alarming rate. And when you, you know, try to think about, well, why is this happening? You have to look at human trafficking as an economic situation. It's a problem of supply and demand. Um, if it's fueled by a demand for cheap labor and services and a fueled by a demand for commercial sex, traffickers are not just mean people doing this to be mean. They're doing it to make money. And it's really the demand that drives the need for traffickers to create victims of trafficking. So you see that, you know, demand for cheap labor and commercial sex turns into exploitation, which results in traffickers taking advantage of this demand and creating um, a supply, basically turning people into commodities. And we think about human trafficking um, as a tree and think about all of the root causes that might be fueling and causing this situation to exist in our world. You can see that there's many things at the root of this tree, um, poverty, homelessness, child abuse, drugs, greed, pornography, sexual abuse, broken families. And if we think about addressing human trafficking, we can't just cut down the tree 
we really need to address those root causes. And you can see too and think about many exploitations and injustices that are, go on in our world today often share a lot of those um, root causes. I mean, especially to, you know, to church groups and, and faith-based groups, I often say too that those root causes are really all summed up in one word and that's just the sin and evil that's in the world today. And, you know, we need a solution to address that. And, we have that through, you know, through our Lord. Um, so who are the victims of human trafficking? Well, they're men, they're children, they're adults. Um, they are, come from many social economic backgrounds. They have a variety of educations. Um, they've been identified in all 50 states. And we often say they're hidden in plain sight. Um, traffickers recognize and exploit people's vulnerabilities. Um, there's no one common victim of human trafficking. Um, we've seen girls from um, very, you know, good students in high school to, um, to runaway youth become victims of human trafficking. But one of the things that we do um, start to see is that traffickers uh, trafficking does span many demographics, um, but there are some circumstances or vulnerabilities that lead to very high susceptibility to becoming a victim. And those are things like um, poverty and unstable housing. Um, runaways and foster care youth are very um, high risk. Our LGBTQ um, you know, folks are very high risk of becoming um, victimized and becoming, uh, having a trafficker exploit their vulnerabilities. Well, who are the traffickers? Well, there's some of those same factors that contribute to somebody becoming a victim often are what we find has happened to a trafficker. They may be, um, have come up and been brought up into a home of violence, of abuse, of drugs, and find themselves then becoming um, a, a manipulator and exploiter too. They often use tactics like pretending to be something they're not, um, promising to give uh, gifts and um, a romantic relationship, um, giving food um, and a shelter to say a runaway youth, um, pro providing protection for someone um, or being very violent. Um, they use all of these techniques to, um, to groom and to um, kind of trap their person um, before they then, you know, have them um, in, in their control. Some of the traits of traffickers, uh, they, there are a variety of ages and genders and ethnicities, social economic backgrounds. Sometimes it's a small business owner. It could be family members. We do see a lot of familia trafficking, uh, labor brokers, pimps, gangs are often getting into trafficking rather than selling drugs. Um, selling drugs, you have to keep going back and getting more drugs, but selling a person, you can sell that person over and over and over again. Um, and they use very, um, very interesting manipulative and um, techniques to trap their victims. Um, they could seem very charming. So for young girls, um, that's often what we see is traffickers approaching them, being this Romeo, being very charming, buying them gifts, um, taking them to fancy places and promising that they are going to love them and take care of them forever. And then they turn the switch and become something else. They are um, expert exploiters um, and they can use those um, manipulative psychological uh, manipulation tricks to get people under con their control. And how does it happen? Well, they manipulate and exploit vulnerabilities, like I said. They may um, target and trick a person and then um, traumatize them using psychological manipulation and it's very similar to what we have seen happen like in domestic violence, where we um, see a woman who's trapped in a domestic violence situation and we say, well, why doesn't she leave? 
well, you know, it's not that easy. Her mind has been manipulated and psychologically she's been traumatized and doesn't see a way out. And the, those same techniques are what traffickers use to manipulate a person. They may threaten to do physical harm to them, um, intimidating them, killing other people in front of them, showing their force. Um, I've heard of that where a trafficker will take a person and make that person be an example for everyone else so that they all of the um, victims under his control are, are frightened because they know what he's capable of. Um, often um, adult women have children and their children will be um, threatened. Um, and that, that's an, a way that the trafficker then can keep that person under his control. They may threaten to go back and get a person's sister or hurt their parents or do something to their family, um, creating um, economic dependency. You know, a lot of traffickers use drugs to get their victims hooked on drugs so that then in order to get those drugs, they have to stay under the control of the trafficker. And so this, you know, power and control wheel is very similar to what we've seen in domestic violence, that Stockholm syndrome, um, extreme, extreme trauma and coercion and psychological uh, manipulation is what keeps people um, under the control of the trafficker. So often they're not locked up. They may be uh, young girls going to school, young boys going to school. They could be shopping at the store. I mean, you could see them, um, you know, out in the community. They're not locked up all the time, but they are under the control of that person who they know will hurt them or beat them or hurt someone they love if they do anything that he does not approve of them doing. And, you know, it's, it's hard to understand the victim's mindset. Um, you know, we, we wonder like, well, why don't they just leave if they're not locked up? Um, and they, they don't often even know that they're being exploited. Uh, they've undergone such extreme um, emotional um, abuse that they um, are threatened, they're fearful, and um, the, sometimes the bond between the victim and the trafficker, um, they think that that trafficker loves them, that they're really taking care of them, that there's nobody else that they could go to. The trafficker devalues um, a person so much that they really think that nobody else will care and they are um, often very hopeless. They have a very uh, sense of hopelessness and they don't see a way out and they don't even understand their own ex exploitation. And many times they've been um, hooked on drugs and addicted to drugs and substances or um, use substances because that's the only way that they can deal with the violence that they have to live with every day. And so they, um, you know, they, they get into these situations where the trafficker then is providing their drugs and they don't see a way out of that situation. So there's many barriers to why they can't get out of their situation. Again, the, the psychological trauma, the shame, the addiction, they often don't know who they can trust. Um, trafficker will say, you know, no, nobody, you know, law enforcement is, is going to just arrest you and put you in jail. You can't trust them. Um, you know, the, you, you don't have anybody but me that, that cares about you. Who would, you know, who would, who would care about you? And they shame them and self-blame them and, and they don't, you know, see a way out of their situation. Where it happens? Well, in Michigan, we see um, very many different forms of human trafficking and it happens in big cities and small cities. It happens in, you know, all across our state from the big city of Detroit all the way to, um, you know, tribal communities in the Upper Peninsula. It happens in small towns and big towns. Um, many of the, um, the typical places we see trafficking in Michigan is through domestic servitude. Um, so, so people who are um, brought into a home to care for children to uh, clean the house and this type of trafficking is often very difficult to find because the person is usually confined to the home. 
Um, often in agriculture, there may be trafficking. In Michigan, we have a lot of migrant workers that um, come on the west side of Michigan. I'm not saying that all migrant workers are trafficked, but it's a high risk area. And it's not um, highly regulated, so nobody's really checking on those camps and, and um, farms. Often in the lawn and garden business, we might see it um, a lot in nail salons, uh, brothels. Uh, we don't see as much street prostitution in uh, the metro communities. Um, it's moved to more online escorts. It's moved to home brothels and to hotels. And this is just a website that I would just encourage you to check out. It kind of talks about the trajectory of girls who um, have been in the life of being, being prostituted oh, and how their life often is um, a series of many on-ramps to something else. So they may have been born into um, a, you know, a very unstable family where then that led to child abuse, which might have led to foster care. And so this kind of you know, on-ramp into more um, high-risk situations and more um, risk of becoming victimized. And there's very few off-ramps into something that would be more helpful. Um, and so it's just something that, you know, to consider as you kind of think of this, you know, life, this on-ramp of somebody who's just been caught in this life of exploitation. You know, what are the ways that we could reach and create off-ramps to help people, you know, earlier on, you know, just dealing with child abuse as a community or, or helping um, foster kids who, um, kids who age out of foster care, you know, many of them become trapped into some type of uh, a crime or commercial sex um, because they don't have anywhere else to go or anything else to do and traffickers take advantage of those vulnerabilities. Some of the things that you can look for, um, again, we often say that victims are hidden in plain sight. And so it, as a community, as we become more educated about trafficking, you know, we can be more alert to watch for things that we think, you know, don't look right. And if we see something that doesn't look right, we should say something and call somebody. Um, you know, you may be helping and saving a person. Um, looking for somebody who appears to be being controlled by another person, um, especially somebody who's very young, under 18, who might be providing a commercial sex acts or being um, drug into pornography. Um, documented confiscation of foreign nationals that don't have any documents. Uh, they don't have um, ID or lack of their personal finances or personal papers. Um, it looks like somebody's monitoring them, always speaking for them, um, you know, those type of, of things, nervousness. Um, there's, you know, many signs that somebody might be in a situation that um, might be a trafficking situation. And some of the things that you might ask someone if you came in contact, um, a lot of times, like I said, they don't know that they're even a victim of exploitation. Um, you know, do, does anybody control or supervise your work? Are you working? Um, what are your working conditions? Do you feel safe? What would happen if you left your job? Um, are you being paid what you were promised? Does somebody else have your money? Those type of things, um, you know, might help get some information from somebody to know if they might be in a situation where they might need some help. Um, a, and one thing that we always want to stress, um, you know, definitely if you would see something, you know, you want to call um, law enforcement, don't push yourself in an unsafe situation. Um, traffickers are violent and they will, um, you know, do violent acts and, and it's, it's not um, in most of our best interest to intervene in a situation that could become pretty um, violent. So, you know, call the law enforcement, call the human trafficking hotline if you see something. Um, if you are in contact with a victim, if somebody would say, come to your church and disclose to you, um, you know, don't, don't try to pry information about their traumatization, the, what they've been through, but just listen and try to make a person feel safe. Um, they often don't know who they can trust. And, and so many times their trust has been let down 
for so many times in their life. And so um, building trust is so important to avoid re-traumatizing someone and helping them to see that there are trustworthy people and that they can get help, that they do have choices and that they can be empowered to, um, to have a journey of healing. Again, if you, um, if you have, would like any information or have um, suspect trafficking, this is the human trafficking hotline number, 888-373-7888. Um, it's not like a 911. If you suspect something and have questions about a situation, you can call this number and you know let them know and, and ask for resources or help. Um, again, I, you know definitely if you see a, a trafficking situation, that's the number to call or in an emergency um, 911 call, you know, definitely call your local police. And one of the things that I would encourage everyone to do is take some kind of action to, um, to address human trafficking. Um, there's a website called slaveryfootprint.org and I would encourage you to go out to that website. Uh, you can take a little quiz and it, it educates you on some of the products that you eat, use and wear every day. And many of those products that we eat, use, and wear every day have slavery baked in the, si the supply chain at some point. So um, learning about some choices that we can make, um, products that we could buy that are more ethically made helps reduce the demand for slavery. Because honestly, we all are um, part of the demand for slavery. We all like cheap prices in the US. We all like chocolate that's mostly made by um, children who are denied education and freedom. So there's uh, choices we can make to help, you know, change that, to help reduce the demand, buying fair trade and buying products that are um, made by survivors and supporting survivor-led um, enterprises. And then, you know, um, you know, reducing the, the view of pornography, fighting the, the, fight the new drug is an excellent um, organization and website that is educating so many people on the harms of pornography and what how it's fueling a lot of the exploitation in our world. So taking some kind of action because we all are the customer in some regard and it's dry that demand is what's driving you know human trafficking. All right so I've talked for a while now I'm going to let you um, ask some questions or if you have any comments for me. What was that phone number again? Um, yeah, let me go back there and there it is. 888-373-7888. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So have, um, so have you heard much about human trafficking before this presentation? I'm just curious what... Um, everyone's kind of understanding is about about human trafficking do you know someone named pat bell a man um it doesn't it's not ringing the bell no <laughs> because he is in um i don't want to say he's into it but he uh he works for uh sex sex trafficking and he's placed in romeo oh okay he's no uh, he's what what organization does he work with? Uh, I'm not really sure. I haven't talked to him in a long time. It's probably a year ago. He was, his uh, wife was in the hospital the same time my husband was, and we got talking. Oh, okay. He's gone to Africa and been to places where they uh, get the girls, you know, keep them safe and that kind of stuff. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, most, most of our work is in Michigan, is here domestic. We, um, we do support, we have products on our website that we support uh, um, survivors um, from Cambodia who have made some products and we purchase them to help support that. But typically our um, main focus is in Michigan here domestically. Well, he was saying that they were, they were thinking of getting some kind of a refuge place somewhere in the area by Romeo. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So it's needed. There's, there's, uh, you know, we, we definitely need more resources for victims of trafficking. They're, 
they do struggle in finding um, help and, and resources. Yeah. You know what type of refuge places we have in the state? Like, is it individual families that will support someone for a while as they transition with therapy and so forth, or is it actual physical? Sometimes, buildings? yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I I had someone in my home for a year, and I know some people that have done done that. There are some homes that have come uh, been um, launched in the last few years. There's two in Oakland County that are um, residential treatment centers just for women, adult women um, mm -hmm. of trafficking. Vista Maria down in Dearborn has a very good program for minors. And there's another organization, Alternatives for Girls mm -hmm. in Detroit that um, typically deal with minors and young adults. So we are seeing, um, you know, we are seeing more services for victims, but it's, um, the transitional piece is very difficult because it, it um, their journey is very long mm -hmm. a lot of times. And, you know, they've, um, they, uh, they sometimes have criminal records because they were forced to commit crimes. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times their credit is ruined because the trafficker does things in their name. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I know a young lady who for years couldn't open a bank account because of her credit was so bad. And it's very difficult to get those things cleared up. So aside from just the traumatic, you know, healing they need to do um, psychologically, part, emotionally, yeah. they have all these, you know, practical things that are, that are barriers. Um, you know, it's hard to get a job when you have a felony on your record, you know, yeah. so. I have a friend that works down at, Al well, he volunteers down at Alternative for Girls once a week. So I've been mm -hmm. doing that a long time, but I didn't realize they were involved in that as well. And yeah, some other areas they were involved with. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, they they yeah. Um, it's a great organization. They do a lot of preventive work too. They do street outreach and work with um, you. you know young girls trying to you know prevent you know teach them the signs of uh, mm -hmm. you know what traffickers try to do and you know we and we do a lot of that too. Just trying to you know reach out to young people to say don't you know get caught up in the promises and the, the the lures because traffic is what they do. Do you have any records as to the relationship between male and female traffickers? Um, you know, typically uh, we see more males, but um, a lot of times the a lot of the women who have been trafficked often get turned into traffickers because they can recruit the women better. And um, so we do see that transition happening where uh, someone might have been trafficked for a number of years and that person then starts to be a recruiter as well. Um, I don't know, I don't know if I could, you know, like I said, there's not reliable statistics. I don't know if I could say, you know, definitively that there's, you know, more men than women, but mostly I see that traffickers are men exploiting women. And definitely when we start, when we talk about commercial sex, um, mostly, mostly men are the, the, on the demand side are the sex buyers. When you were doing your PowerPoint, did you say chocolate was something that was often um, made yeah. by people that are being trafficked? Um, so, uh, I, I use that as an example of one item that, you know, that we all probably, you know, use, like we bake chocolate chip cookies and we buy chocolate things. <laughs> um, much of the chocolate in the world comes from the Ivory Coast in Africa and many children, um, are, uh, exploited to raise those cocoa beans, the, the cacao and, um, and that, that is then, you know, turned into chocolate. So companies like Nestle and, um, you know, uh, Hershey's, um, a lot of those companies have not taken care to make sure that their supply chains are um, ethical and that that slavery is not happening in that, that their supply chain. So if you, um, if you notice, like when you go to the grocery store, you might see some chocolate that has um, like rainforest compliant or fair trade, uh, I know that at Aldi's they have fair trade chocolate um, and Whole Foods, places like that. You it, you'll see chocolate that's fair trade, 
And what that means is, is that somebody has um, looked in that supply chain and made sure that everybody who was involved in making that product um, was, was treated fairly and, was, um, and that received a fair wage and that, that there was no exploitation going on. Um, there's been a lot of, um, there's been progress with some of the big chocolate companies like Nestle's and Hershey's, but it's, we're still not there. Um, you know, we've done, you know, written letters and, and the consumers, consumers vote with their money, right? So, um, you know, putting pressure on companies to become more ethical in their practices and care about their supply chain is what needs to happen. Um, you know, we, we used to make a lot of products here in the United States where we have labor practices, but much of our stuff is made in China now, right? Or comes from other countries. And, um, and that's where we need, you know, really need to put the pressure on companies to look at those supply chains. And if there's slavery, you know, if there's abuse going on that, that they should um, address that and not, not, um, you know, take advantage of that. Does that mean like when you go to the store, if it says free trade, or is that what you said, free trade? Fair trade, yeah. Fair trade. Fair trade. Oh, but if it doesn't? If it doesn't, then you don't know. I guess then, you know, then there's research you can do. There's, there are websites where you can look up different companies. And, you know, what I do is um, I'll go to a company's website and, and, and see if they at least are, have policies in place where they're saying, um, you know, recently I, I bought some clothes from Kohl's and I noticed that on some of the products they said that the cotton was, um, was sourced with sustainable, sustainability, meaning that they were making sure that there were good practices in place. And I thought, oh, well, that's progress. You know, a lot of times you don't oh, yeah. know, you don't know where something comes from, but you know, there uh, definitely companies are starting to feel the pressure from consumers uh, to to have policies in place. And so, um, if you go to say IKEA's website, you'll see they they talk a lot about where they get the wood, where they get the cotton, where they get their products, and how that they work with farmers. They they um, they research where their products came from. Other companies don't really seem to care. Uh, so. You know, that, that's the kind of thing where just, you know, researching the things that you like to buy. You know, we started with coffee because we drink coffee every morning. And so we buy fair trade coffee. Um, and then chocolate was another thing that when we buy chocolate chips, I make sure that it says it was ethically sourced or it's fair trade, uh, you know, in my baking. So, you know, it, it um, you know, as a consumer, you know, think about the things that you use and just kind of start one by one. And looking into well, what you know, if you shop at a certain store, what what are their policies? You know, do they care about where these things are made, and if there's slavery, you know, in the the production of that product? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kathy, I don't know if this was asked before, but what made you get into this effort initially? <laughs> um, I was at some things like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, I was, I had, as I mentioned, I was working at Hewlett Packard and I, you know, I went to, um, I think it was a leader, the global leadership summit uh, that Willow Creek puts on years ago. And I first learned about um, trafficking in another country yeah. and um, I just couldn't believe it. I was just so, um, you know, uh, sickened by it, but also just felt like here I've been raising my kids you know, having a happy life and all the while this has been happening and people are being, being abused and exploited. And so it just kind of, you know, raised a passion in me to start to be involved. And so I started to go on the websites and read more about it and, yeah. you know, decide to volunteer. And I really didn't set out to be the director no, of an organization. I, I really didn't. Um, um, sure. I, I just volunteered yeah, and just, I'll tell you know, you it kind of happened. <laughs> yeah, that's what, yeah, okay, I, I've done yeah. something similar in the past as well. Mm -hmm. But um, just for the others' information, like here in Hazel Park, we have a neighborhood watch group, which I belong to with other friends and so forth. And they, the, since the police meet with us every few months or so, they give us the statistics and they keep us up to date because there is a human tracking, trafficking task force among the police departments here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. 
and they'll tell us what's happening at the hotels in the area or where the hot spots are. And I, I remember when I read an in-depth article a couple of years ago that Detroit was a number two trafficking place in the country. And I don't know if it still is, uh, you know, because we're so close to the borders in a couple spots. But yeah, we, we are. Um, I mean, definitely we are a high risk state because we have big cities, Detroit, Grand Rapids. We've got roadways that go you know, I-75 down to Toledo, yeah. you know, so we, we definitely are high risk. The number two thing happened from, I think it kind of gotten, it was, it was taken out of context, context a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, what it came from was, it was a sting that was done a few years ago and they had, um, it, it was called um, Operation Innocence, I think, and they, the, they, uh, um, FBI around very many major cities in the United States all went out on one day and um, raided uh, pro some prostitution rings. And they were specifically looking for minors who were being abused. And so Detroit had the second largest number of minors rescued oh. and um, traffickers and pimps arrested. Mm -hmm. um, so it could mean that we're number two, but it also could mean that our law enforcement did a really good job. You know, yeah. that they, it, it doesn't really mean that, but um, you know, definitely it's going on. And I think we're, you know, we're right up there with it happening in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your insight. Yeah, that's good that you're involved in that community um, neighborhood watch. That sounds really like a great program, helping to keep the community informed and yeah, um, yeah. It's nice to get the inside story since we do meet with the police department. I mean, mm -hmm. you can read some things in the paper, but yeah, and to be a part of like you, all the things you mentioned on your sort of list of things to be aware of that's happening around you when you're out and about, and 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 it's good to have those reinforcements. Um, right, right. And you know, if people don't call, if people don't call and don't report, they often can't do anything, and so. Yeah. Um, that's really why law enforcement really does rely on the community. To... And they always tell us if you see something in your neighborhood and you're not sure, make that call. You don't right. Have, whether the 911 or the non 911 number in your town, and let them make the decision. Right. Want to go right. out and check it out? You know, you're That's not right. you just report what you see. Get yep. your job and let them make the decision. And who knows? Yep. I save a life along the way somewhere. That's right. That's good advice. Real good. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Oh, it was very interesting. Very informative. Yes, it was. Enjoyed it. Well, we have, um, you know, I, I would pass out information right now if we were in the room together. <laughs> <laughs> but I could send you some, you know, some brochures and information about our organization. And uh, we have a little card that talks about the signs to look for and has the hotline number on it. So if you'd like, I could send that to your, um, to your church or to one of you. I don't know the best way to get it to you. Can you send any of those couple lists you had uh, to us to be emailed out maybe that you showed on your presentation? This oh, time? sure. Yeah. A couple of those pages look pretty good. And boy, I wish I yeah. had that handy, but I couldn't write fast enough, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah I think sure. if, you, if you want to send it to me, I'm in charge of outreach. Okay. Um, send it to my home. I think it will get distributed faster that way than if it goes to the church. Yeah. I, also, Kathy, we are sending you a check. Uh, your organization, it will be in tomorrow's mail. So. Well, thank you. We, we thank you very much for coming and sharing with us. And it was an eye opener. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you for the call. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.